Hello everyone, here we are. We're back to do Exodus 3. And we know it's been at least a hundred years. It's been four generations since Joseph now to Moses' time. So it's been at least a hundred years, give or take probably give a few more depending on the generation of a particular family. A generation is usually about 25 years. Um, the Egyptian king we know was very cruel to the Israelites and put them in severe bondage building the cities of the Egyptians. Now Moses was raised as we heard by Pharaoh's daughter who pulled him out of the Nile, had his own mother uh, nurse him. I don't know if she knew it was his mother and then took him to herself as her son. And when he grew up, uh, he was very offended by Hebrews uh, hurting other Hebrews, Egyptians hurting the Hebrews because apparently he knew he was Hebrew. So he ended up killing an Egyptian man and everybody heard about it, so he fled into the wilderness and he met uh, some young daughters of a man who I believe his name was Reuel, R-E-U-E-L, and he married the oldest daughter, okay, Zipporah. I'm almost positive Zipporah was the oldest daughter, okay? So here we go. Now, and he's living far out of Egypt now, I believe he, I wanna say he's in Midian, but I could be wrong, we'll hear. Exodus 3. Now, Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. So, Jethro. Uh, it seems that he was called Rule when he first met the daughters, but I don't know. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's another name for the same person. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, H-O-R-E-B, the mountain of God. There, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it didn't burn up. So Moses thought, I'll go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he'd gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, what? Here I am. Remember, that's the way we address the Lord when he calls us. Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me and I've seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you to them. I'm sorry. And this will be, I'm sorry. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what's his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am, and that is in capital letters. The whole thing, I am who I am. This is what you're to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. 
God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. Isn't that interesting? He takes someone who was raised in the palace to be that mediator, right? Because he understands the palace of Pharaoh, yet he's a Hebrew. This quote, God speaking, this is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. And what is that name? I am, or I am who I am. I am is the name. Go assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob appeared to me and said, I have watched over you and have seen what has been done to you in Egypt. And I've promised to bring you up out of your misery in Egypt into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. And this is where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob kept returning to, was the land of Canaan, if you remember. That's where they're buried. That's where Jacob wanted to be taken back to. That's their land. But they've been in Egypt thriving for a long time until they were thrown into this vicious, uh, angry slavery. The elders of Israel will listen to you. Then you and the elders are to go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. So I'll stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them. After that, he'll let you go. And I'll make the Egyptians favorably disposed towards this people so that when you leave, you won't go empty handed. Every woman is to ask her neighbor and any woman living in her house for articles of silver and gold and for clothing when you, which you will put on your sons and daughters. And so you will plunder the Egyptians. Okay, Exodus 4. You know, I want to say something. For those of you who see Ollie, well, he's behind me now on the couch, but for those of you who see him on the dining room table, I don't eat there. I would never let a cat walk on kitchen counters or anywhere that I eat. That table is a desk for me. It's where I used to work, and it's now where I color. <laughs> Retirement is great. Um, it's just, it's a, it's also where I do all of my bills and stuff. It's a desk. It's got two, you know, it's a neat story. I inherited that table and it is built like a desk. It has two drawers on one side of it. I don't think they go all the way through to the other side. I think it's just, just has two drawers on one side and they're side by side, long, thin drawers. And I thought the table was beautiful. I inherited it from a job I had before the last job in real estate that I had. It was the conference table at this job and um, the boss wanted to get rid of it because he wanted to put in some newfangled modern conference table. So uh, he gave it to me and I absolutely love it. It's very beautiful. It's a little shabby chic but it's in great condition and it's huge. It's exactly what I've always wanted for a desk. So anyway, he's on, Ollie's on my desk. I would never have a cat anywhere else, you know, where I eat or where anything needs to be clean. So just so you know that. All right, um, Exodus 4. Moses answered, what if they don't believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord didn't appear to you? Then the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? A staff, he replied. The Lord said, throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake and he ran from it. Can you just imagine that? 
Then the Lord said to him, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out and took hold of the snake and it turned back into a staff in his hand. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. Then the Lord said, put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand into his cloak, and when he took it out, the skin was leprous. It had become as white as snow. Now put it back into your cloak, he said. So Moses put his hand back into his cloak, and when he took it out, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. Then the Lord said, if they don't believe you or pay attention to the first sign, they may believe the second. But if they don't believe these two signs or listen to you, take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. The water you take from the river will become blood on the ground. Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. I've never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you've spoken to your servant. I'm slow of speech and tongue. Some people think Moses might have been somewhat of a stutterer. He obviously had some something that in, an, a speech impediment of some sort. We just don't know what it was. But you don't normally say I'm slow of speech and tongue, okay, unless you're speaking of something that you suffer from. The Lord said to him, who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? It is, is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I told you the Lord's the author of everything. Even the bad times have to be allowed. But what you and I are required to know is that we have a good God that even if he allows a bad time, he's going to work it out so that you're blessed beyond your wildest dreams. He's going to make it work for your good, according to Romans 8, correct? Everything works together for your good. So don't fear those times, even though they hurt terribly. I just went through one. I mean... I don't, you know, the Lord did it two months with no income and I was okay. You know, I did, I did break down, but oh my goodness, you know, that was as far as I could go. I guess trusting the Lord was two months and then I wigged out. <laughs> you know, we all have our breaking point, but next time I'll do even better, huh? Each time we go a little further and a little further in our trust of the Lord. Hopefully there won't be a next time like that. It was excruciatingly difficult and painful. All right. Um, now go. I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. But Moses said, pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses, and he said, What about your brother Aaron, the Levite? I know he can speak well. He's already on his way to meet you, and he'll be glad to see you. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. I'll help both of you speak, and we'll teach you what to do. So that was Aaron's purpose, was to speak for Moses. So we don't often think about that. We think of Charlton Heston in the Ten Commandments saying, Let my people go! But probably most of the time it was Aaron saying, the Lord wants you to let his people go. Okay, so this was, this was uh, two brothers helping each other out here with the Lord enabling them. Okay. Um, he will speak to the people for you and it will be as if he were your mouth and as if you were God to him. So picture that. He's saying there's going to stand Moses, maybe looking like Charlton Heston, you know, with the gray hair and just totally beautiful. And then he's going to be standing there in the authority of God. And then there's going to be Aaron doing the talking. Okay. He will speak to the people for you and it'll be as if he were your mouth and as if you were God to him. But take this staff in your hand so you can perform the signs with it. Okay, this is why Aaron was so important, okay? 
Then Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, let me return to my own people in Egypt to see if any of them are still alive. Jethro said, go, and I wish you well. Now the Lord said to Moses in Midian, okay, so he is in Midian, go back to Egypt for all those who wanted to kill you are dead. So he's been in Midian for a long, long time. So Moses took his wife and sons, put them on a donkey, and started back to Egypt. And he took the staff of God in his hand. And I want to make a mention of something. You know, I was talking to a friend a couple of nights ago. And somehow it came up. She said, you know, there are just so many terrifying pastors. Now, I'm not saying this to dishonor the Lord and the people he's chosen. But she was talking about so many that really are corrupt. She was talking about the corrupt ones. And for some reason, I looked up a pastor that, I don't think he was corrupt, but he wasn't a great pastor. And I remember his wife said something very heartless to me once when I was in their church for a matter of, I don't know how long I was in it, not long. But, um, and I forgive her. I'm really working hard on cleaning the crust out of the crevices of my heart that is unforgiveness. The Lord's bringing things to me and I'm like, man, I've been holding on to that for a long time. It's gotta go. All right, so we're working on it. But um, I was remembering this pastor and I looked him up and he was dead. And it seemed to me, you know, he died last year and it seemed to me that a few other people I've looked up are dead. And it's just weird because I feel like I'm entering into maybe the beginning of something in my life, maybe the beginning of my life's goal and a lot of the people that I walked with have passed away. So that sentence just reminded me of that. You know, the people that, um, uh, all those who wanted to kill you are dead. Well, these people didn't want to kill me. But a lot of, you know, old um, people that did harm me within the church, they're gone. So it's very strange. I don't know why that reminded me of it, but I want you to trust me that I'm working right now on, like I say, the crust in the crevices of my heart that is hardened unforgiveness. And it's not too hard to forgive them now because I realize how silly it is and how I've been so unaware that I've been carrying some unforgiveness for so long. It's not proper. Okay. Um... The Lord said to Moses, when you return to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders I've given you the power to do. But I'll harden his heart so that he won't let the people go. Then say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says. Israel is my firstborn son, and I told you, let my son go so he may worship me. But you refuse to let him go, so I will kill your firstborn son. Scary thing to have to say, huh? And most likely Aaron is the one who's going to say it. At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. Wow. Big switch up here. At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. But Sipporah took a flint knife cut off her son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it. Surely you're a bridegroom of blood to me, she said. So the Lord let him alone. Okay, I'm going to explain what happened. It says here in parentheses, at that time she said, bridegroom of blood, referring to circumcision. Now, in Midian, they're not Israelites and they're not circumcised. Okay? So um, Zipporah was against having her son be circumcised. And the Lord wasn't going to allow Moses to go on the road, so to speak, without everybody in right standing. And that would mean circumcising his son. And I believe his son may have been a teenager, okay, or preteen. So recognizing that the Lord is just going to kill her husband, she goes, because they probably have been arguing over circumcision, probably their whole marriage. 
okay? This is conjecture, but this is what it sounds like to me when the Lord went to meet Moses to just kill him because he wasn't getting things in order. So Porah grabbed a knife, circumcised her son, touched the feet or perhaps threw at Moses' feet the foreskin and then screamed at him, surely you're a bridegroom of blood to me. Okay, that's what just happened, all right? The Lord said to Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So now that was just sort of like a weird little aside in the middle of Moses, uh, the Lord telling Moses, you're gonna tell Egypt to let my firstborn son Israel go. If you don't, I'm going to take your firstborn. And then we have this weird little aside of Moses' son getting circumcised by Zipporah, his wife. And then it goes back to the Lord said to Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So whew, everything's settled now. Everything's ready to go. Okay. We have a holy God and he is a finisher of things. Okay. He does everything decently and in order. Okay. So he met Moses at the mountain of God and kissed him. Then Moses told Aaron everything the Lord had sent him to say, and also about all the signs he'd commanded him to perform. So they're talking about what's gonna happen now. Moses and Aaron brought together all the elders of the Israelites, and Aaron told them everything the Lord had said to Moses. Okay, so picture, Moses is standing there with his staff, Aaron is doing the talking, okay? Because Moses is like the picture of God in relation to Aaron. And Aaron is like Moses' mouth, which is how God uses us, correct? He stands there and we speak for him, okay? Whatever he puts in our heart. He also performed the signs before the people. So that would be Moses' part to do those signs. And they believed and when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshiped. So that would be very pleasing to the Lord, correct? Exodus 5. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go so that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I don't know the Lord, and I'll not let Israel go. Then they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Now let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God, or he may strike us with plagues or with the sword. But the king of Egypt said, Moses and Aaron, why are you taking the people away from their labor? Get back to your work. Then Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are now numerous and you're stopping them from working. That same day, Pharaoh gave this order to the slave drivers and overseers in charge of the people. You're no longer to supply the people with straw for making bricks. Let them go and gather their own straw, but require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Don't reduce the quota. They're lazy. That's why they're crying out. Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Make the work harder for the people so that they keep working and pay no attention to lies. Something about that reminds me of what we're going through here in America right now with all the lies. With bad people saying that the truth are lies. That's what that reminds me of. So here's this bad Pharaoh saying that the truth out of Aaron's mouth is a lie. And that's what he's going to promote to the people is, ah, they're lying. Don't listen to them. Then the slave drivers and the overseers went out and said to the people, this is what Pharaoh says. I'll not give you any more straw. Go and get your own straw wherever you can find it. But your work will not be reduced at all. So the people scattered all over Egypt to gather stubble to use for straw. Man, I, I feel like I'd be in tears, although there's probably the work was probably too hard to have a minute to squeeze out a tear, huh? The slave drivers kept pressing them, saying, Complete the work required of you each day, just as when you had straw. And Pharaoh's slave drivers beat the Israelite overseers they had appointed, demanding, Why haven't you met your quota of bricks yesterday or today as before? Then the Israelite overseers went and appealed to Pharaoh, 
Why have you treated your servants this way? Your servants are given no straw, yet we're told, make bricks. Your servants are being beaten, but the fault is with your own people. Pharaoh said, lazy, that's what you are, lazy. That's why you keep saying, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Now get to work. You will not be given any straw, yet you must produce your full quota of bricks. The Israelite overseers realized they were in trouble when they were told you're not to reduce the number of bricks required of you for each day. When they left Pharaoh, they found Moses and Aaron waiting to meet them. Oh, hallelujah. And they said, may the Lord look on you and judge you. You've made us obnoxious to Pharaoh and his officials and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. Moses returned to the Lord and said, why, Lord, have you brought this trouble on this people? Is this why you sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he's brought trouble on this people and you haven't res rescued your people at all. We do get mad at God, don't we? You should have heard me saying, Lord, isn't the workman worthy of his meat? You said, and we can remind God of his promises. Hopefully we're not screaming and crying. Exodus 6, and this will be our last one for tonight. Then the Lord said to Moses, now you'll see what I will do to Pharaoh. Or I should say that different. Now you'll see what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand, he'll let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he'll drive them out of his country. He'll drive them out of his country. God also said to Moses, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself fully known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan where they resided as foreigners. Moreover, I've heard the groaning of the Israelites whom the Egyptians are enslaving, and I've remembered my covenant. Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians and I'll bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord." Moses reported this to the Israelites, but they didn't listen to him because of their discouragement and harsh labor. I understand that too, where you're just exhausted and you just don't want to hear anymore. You know, like, don't tell me, I don't want to hear it. Then the Lord said to Moses, go tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the Israelites go out of his country. But Moses said to the Lord, if the Israelites will not listen to me, why would Pharaoh listen to me since I speak with faltering lips? Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron about the Israelites and Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he commanded them to bring the Israelites out of Egypt. These were the heads of their families. The sons of Reuben, the firstborn son of Israel, were Hanuk and Palu, Hezron and Carmi. These were the clans of Reuben. The sons of Simeon were Jemuel, Jamin, Ohad, Jachin, Zohar, and Shal, the son of a Canaanite woman. These were the clans of Simeon. These were the names of the sons of Levi, according to their records, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. Levi lived 137 years. The sons of Gershon, by clans, were Libni and Shammai. The sons of Kohath were Amram, Ishar, Hebron, Uziel, Kohath lived 133 years. The sons of Merari were Mali and Mushi. These were the clans of Levi, according to their records. Summation sentence, I think. Uh, no, maybe that's a title sentence. Amram, these were the clans of Levi, according to their records. Amram married his father's sister, Jochebed, who bore him Aaron and Moses. 
Amram lived 137 years. The sons of Izar were Korah, Nepheg, and Zikri. The sons of U Uziel were Mishael, Elzaphan, and Sithri. Aaron married Elisheba, daughter of Aminadab, and sister of Nashon, and she bore him Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. The sons of Korah were Asir, Elkanah, and Abiasaph. These were the Korite clans. Eleazar, son of Aaron, married one of the doctors of Putiel, and she bore him Phineas. These were the heads of the Levite families, clan by clan. It was this Aaron and Moses to whom the Lord said, bring the Israelites out of Egypt by their divisions. So they're giving you a little background here. And also uh, with Aaron and Moses, we're going to hear about Miriam, one of their sisters. Okay. Uh, it was this Aaron and Moses to whom the Lord said, bring the Israelites out of Egypt by their divisions. They were the ones who spoke to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and bringing, about bringing the Israelites out of Egypt. This same Moses and Aaron. Now, when the Lord spoke to Moses in Egypt, he said to him, I am the Lord. Tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, everything I tell you. But Moses said to the Lord, since I speak with faltering lips, why would Pharaoh listen to me? Don't we do that? Don't we say the same thing after, you know, it was, it, and I'm going to tell you an example. When I had that vision of the angel telling me that uh, my daughter Gabrielle would have a life-altering um experience and she would serve the Lord. You know, I started that conversation with that angel. Now, if you don't believe me, just suspend your disbelief for a minute and just hear me. Okay. You don't have to believe me, but for those that do and that know that I'm speaking the truth, just hear me and everyone else just hear me. Suspend your disbelief. When I asked the angel when he first appeared and he didn't appear in a big glow of light with wings and all that, it just wasn't like that. Uh, he looked like, uh, the word that came to me was centurion. He was just like a man, but very um, pure looking. And I tested the spirit and he, I realized he was from the Lord, not from the enemy. And the first thing out of my mouth is, is was, is she going to die? So he says, no, she will not die. She'll have a life altering situation uh, experience and she will serve the Lord. Okay. So then he told me some other things. So then as he's leaving, I say to him again, is she going to die? And he turned around and looked at me and he said, the Lord's will be done. But I asked again, just like Moses is saying, since I speak with faltering lips, why would Pharaoh listen to me? Didn't he already ask, say that once before? Ask that once before? I don't know why we do that, folks. I don't know if it's because of a difference in the... Um, in the spirit, you know, we're in flesh, they're in the spiritual realm. I don't, I don't know what it is. I don't know what happens. Is it our unbelief? Is it that we can't truly understand a lot of stuff? I don't know, but I love you very much. And I'll see you tomorrow. We'll pick it up at Exodus 7 and let's get this story done. This is severe. Love you. God bless you. Pray for me. I'm praying for you. Good night.